Hey, hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. This is Brad Cartwright with the latest installment of my How to Draw series, a collaborative effort between me and you. Today we're looking at international economics and the protective subsidy diagram. Let's take a look. All right, so here we go. We're gonna build this protective subsidy diagram. And one of the things you have to realize, and this is just so helpful for you to have in your mind, is you gotta figure out where the beginning of the story is. You're gonna put, I know we're building the protective subsidy. We're gonna put a subsidy in. We're gonna understand what that is. We're gonna talk about what happens. But before the subsidy, you have to know where the story begins because in economics, there's always the beginning of the story and then one event. That event might be a tariff, that, might, that event might be a subsidy, that event might be um, a quota, right? But there's a beginning of the story, and the beginning of the story in all of the protective, um, protection, free trade and protectionism series is all about this one base diagram, which is the base diagram for all of international economics, which is, you got it, the free trade diagram. So if you don't know how to draw the free trade diagram, take a look at that video right now. Stop this, this video right now and go check out how to draw the free trade diagram because this diagram is critical for you to understand before you move into how to draw a protective subsidy or how to draw a protective tariff or how to draw a protective quota, okay? So check out that video, then come back so that you can be fully informed about this particular um, diagram. All right, so... Protective subsidy, what's going to happen? Okay, we start off with the base diagram for international economics, which is the free trade diagram, which is composed of price, dollar sign, P1, PW, 0, Q3, Q1, Q2, the quantity of corn, or usually any commodity, thousands of bushels per year. We have the figure one market for corn. Always label it figure one in case there's another diagram you have to follow it up with. If there's figure one and there's no figure two, it don't matter. Okay, we have our domestic supply curve, we have our domestic demand curve, and we have our world supply curve. Okay, so now you got to understand the logic here. Who puts in protective subsidies? Governments. Who are governments? Politicians. Why are they going to put in a protective subsidy? Well, somebody's getting hurt based on free trade. That's why they're putting in the protective subsidy. So who's getting hurt? Well, that's where stories in economics come in because they're so important. This whole course is built on human behavior. So if you can imagine, let's say that this is the, um, the market for corn in France, okay? So in France, before France opened up to the world market, okay, beforehand, they were operating at a domestic supply level, price quantity combination of P1Q1, okay? Then France decided to open up its markets to the world, and as a result, corn came in from outside of France, and therefore, the market equilibrium dropped from P1Q1 to P drop from P1Q1 to PWQ2. So the, the market is now operating here. And that's all good and fine if you want to buy corn in France because check it out, you all of a sudden can, right? When the market before it opened up to the world market, it was operating at P1. So all of these demanders couldn't buy corn because it was too expensive. But when they open up, boom, the equilibrium price quantity combination goes out to PWQ2, and all of a sudden they're buying corn. Well, that sounds good, but guess what? Oh, man, what about all these suppliers, these French suppliers? Oh, what about all of these farmers who've had their markets for year, uh, their farms for years? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. They went out of business. They lost the farm, literally, right? So before the subsidy is put in place, the market for corn in France... The, the only French corn that's being produced is represented by this quantity zero to Q3 right here on this domestic supply line. Then what happened? Well, after the price level of PW, because that's how much corn now costs in France, all of these farmers that are French cannot produce, but these world markets can. Maybe this corn's coming from the Ukraine. Maybe it's coming from the United States. Maybe it's coming from anywhere in the world, right? But not French. So... These people are going to complain to the government, as they should, because they're losing their farms, and it's because of free trade, and now all of a sudden, aren't we France? Aren't we France? We need to protect our French farmers. We can't have our farmers going out of business. And so what the government comes in to do, in this case, is they are going to put in a protective subsidy, and this will be S domestic plus the subsidy. 
Wow, what does that mean? Well, that has massive implications in the marketplace, right? Massive implications in the marketplace. First of all, what happened here? There's going to be a new quantity there. This is going to be Q4, okay? And so a rightward shift or an outward shift of this supply curve as a result of the subsidy is going to have massive implications in the market for corn in France. All right, now I'm going to clean this, uh, clean this diagram up a little bit and we'll take a closer look at what that means. All right, so here's a cleaner version of that diagram, right? We're still the same deal, right? We got um, PWQ1, we got P, I'm sorry, yeah, P1Q1, we got PWQ2, um, and now we have an outward shift of the, of the supply curve as a result of the subsidy, and we have a new equilibrium point here of Q4. Okay, so what's with all of these letters? Well, these letters are just put in place in order to help us um, understand who is now earning the money for corn in France. Now, before the subsidy, right? Before the subsidy, who, how much revenue was going into the pockets of French, um, of French farmers? Well, if you think about the fact that it was PWQ3, then A, B, and this area down here, this whole box right here, was going into the, that, that revenue was going into, and we'll make it blue because they're French, right? The pockets of who? Of, of, of French farmers, okay? How much was going into the pockets of farmers outside of France? This, this is before, remember, this is before the subsidy, okay? So A and B were going in French pockets, C, D, and E were going into the pockets, this is the, re world, the revenue for world producers, okay? Now, if we remove that, now let's take a look at what would happen after the subsidy. Where is this money going to go? Well, as a result of this outward shift of the supply curve, now all of a sudden, guess what? Because the government is giving French farmers money, these farmers right here can now participate in the marketplace. Because of the outward shift of this curve, the outward shift of this curve, now, all of a sudden, all of these farmers here, because they're given a subsidy by the French government, can produce at a level of PW, okay? So as a result of the subsidy, this is now revenue that is going into the pockets of French farmers. You see that? Guess what the French government did? They protected those farmers. Isn't that nice? Well, of course, that's what governments do. They take care of their own people, right? Now, how much of the corn is coming from world producers? Well, all of this is coming from world producers, D and E. Correct? Correct. Now, here's the last kicker. What about the government? How much is this subsidy, right, costing the government? Well, this costing the government, F, G, right? F and G. This is the amount of money that the French government is going to have to pay to its farmers in order for them to be competitive, right? Boom, okay. But there's one more thing. Guess what actually is happening in this diagram? Because the French farmers are getting a subsidy, which is a gift from the government, while F and G is, all, is the cost of the subsidy to the French government, where does that money going? Hey, check it. It's going into the pockets of those French farmers. So post-subsidy is even better than you thought for French farmers. Because A, B, C, G, and H, all of that is revenue that goes into the pockets of French farmers. They saved all of these people. The French government saved all of these people by giving a subsidy as a so that they could participate under PW, but then they got money on top of that. So every bushel of corn produced in France, they got a subsidy for, and that's how they're able to produce it, okay? So French farmers, clear for clarity, F, G, A, B, C. World producers, D and E. Now there's one last thing we have to account for, which is the welfare loss as a, result, as a result of this movement. Now, there's a government intervention in the marketplace, 
It was free trade, and now there's a subsidy put in, and that's government intervention, and there is always welfare loss as a result of any government intervention. So G also represents the loss of welfare to the world as a result of the subsidy. Okay. One last thing to mention, which is really important. What happened to the price of corn in France? Nothing. Nothing. Remember, the beginning of the story is P1Q1, and then they opened up to the world and it became PWQ2. But guess what? The subsidy doesn't actually affect the price of corn. So all of these producers, all these consumers right here can still buy corn because the, uh, the market is operating at PWQ2. It's just that now, because of the subsidy, the government has enabled the, this revenue right here to be generated, uh, this quantity of corn from Q3 to Q4 to be produced in France. Okay, So one of the important things about the subsidy is it doesn't change the domestic price of corn. Right? It just leads to an increase um, in the government expenditure and also an increase in um, revenue for domestic producers. Okay, that's a differentiator because as a result of this lack of change in the price, it's very different than the protective quota and very different than the protective uh, tariff. Okay? By the way, if you don't know how to draw the protective tariff and the protective quota diagram, check out the videos that are part of this How to Draw series. It's very, very helpful. I just go how, just, just like this video, I just go through how to construct... Um, these diagrams so that you can get them right, so that your valuation and, um, and uh, analysis of this stuff is accurate. Well, there you have it, my friends. The protective subsidy diagram, a pretty fascinating diagram that not only talks about economics, but you can see all the politics behind that, all of the domestic politics that go into providing subsidies to different marketplaces. So as I said at the beginning of the video, this is a collaborative effort. If there are any other uh, diagrams you would like to see included in this series, please let me know. Put them in the comment box below. I read every comment that comes into this channel. I see it as an absolute privilege and honor to be able to connect with you and discuss economics with you. So let's continue the conversation. I really, really enjoy it. Also, if you're interested in subscribing, of course, please do so. Turn on the notifications so you can get a little email or a little thing on your phone that says that I posted another video just so that you can stay up to date and we can stay connected. All right, my friends, be good out there. Be kind to yourself, all right? And we'll talk to you in a bit.